Louisiana, a land rich in history and resources. Originally, the Homer and the Choctaw, but the adopted home of Iberville, Bienville, and Tonti. Louisiana, the focus of international struggle and intrigue for centuries, a place of mystique, the home of a people known for distinct culture and institutions, the parish, the police jury. Louisiana, that catalyst for transforming the form of British North American colonists into a national melting pot. Louisiana, the birthplace of jazz, the refinement of blues and the gospel, the source of Creole and Cajun food, the home of Huey Long and Evangeline, Lee Armstrong and Marie Laveau. The Louisiana Purchase, arguably the world's most significant real estate transaction, will be the subject of this semester-long series, both on its immediate importance but its continuing impact today. Any contemporary discussion of Indians must begin with the nomenclature itself. The controversy over the use of the term Indian mirrors the current debate among other ethnic minorities who reject European colonial names in favor of either ancient generic names or modern pseudonyms, which they feel best describe themselves. Understandably, many descendants of New World inhabitants reject Indian as a mistaken label first used to describe them by Columbus. On the other hand, the current term, Native American, is no more precise because there was no America until Europeans identified it as such in the early 16th century. Since the term Indian is still used more frequently than Native American, therefore, for the sake of clarity, it will be used within this lecture to speak of New World inhabitants collectively, but wherever possible, the tribal society communal names will be used, for example, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Natchez, etc. While contemporary studies define Indians as an ethnic minority, there was a time when they were the majority. In fact, they once constituted the entire population of the New World. Although there is considerable differences of opinion among scholars about the place and time of origin of Indians, practically all reputable scholars agree that they migrated from Old World societies. While the majority of them seem to share a common Asian ancestry, there are a few who appear to have decidedly African or European ancestry. Tor Heyerdahl, noted anthropologist, reenacted several possible routes for old world migrants who have taken to get to the new world. While a few studies push back the date of their arrival as far back as 50,000 BC, most scholars agree that there were Indians present in the New World at least as early as 15,000 BC. Around the middle of the fourth millennium BC, city-states began to emerge in the Old World, and by the time of the birth of Christ, there were several cities with populations in excess of a quarter million. In the New World, however, with only a few exceptions, the progress of civilization proceeded much slower, probably as a result of two reasons the lack of a metal plow to cultivate large stretches of land, and the lack of draft animals to pull plows. The New World inhabitants never developed a wheel, which also prevented them from making comparable advances in technology. For example, during the late medieval period, Europeans benefited greatly from the use of plows hooked to wheels with a sharp knife added to it, which now made it possible to turn hard but otherwise rich virgin soil in Northern Europe. In the New World, these technological deficiencies hindered efforts to support large concentrated population centers. Consequently, for most of their isolated existence, most Indian societies remained at best family clans, grouped together in numbers that rarely exceeded a thousand. The optimum numbers seem to have been three to four hundred in each society. Generally, Indians did not enclose themselves within walls like so many old world societies. The typical Indian village was arranged in circular fashion around an open space. The open space was used to conduct meetings and ceremonies of various types, for example, religious, military, and festive. The more important members lived near the center of the village. The lesser members, especially unmarried braves, lived on the periphery. Those Indians who lived in the lower Mississippi River Valley 
usually built their homes of light wood, cane or reed, and thatched them with grass, moss leaves or corn husk. Among those natives who inhabited modern Louisiana, the Caddo and the Natchez, utilized burial mounds. They arranged them from relatively small mounds of sorrel placed over the graves of their dead to the more elaborate structures, which extended sometimes several feet high and included artifacts belonging to the deceased. Most families lived in a one-room structure that was more practical than decorative. Their meager personal belongings included pottery, cooking pots, woven mats, animal skin water bottles, beds made from canes of wooden poles covered with reed mats, blankets and other clothing made from animal skins of forest. They did not clutter their homes, which they used primarily for sleeping and storage. Most of their activities took place outside their homes. Some groups played a ball game which resembles modern day soccer and football. The French called it tole. Two teams played on the field approximately 200 feet in length. One team scored when it touched the opponent's goal with a leather ball. Almost universally, they held boxing matches, swimming competitions, as well as foot races. Since most of the members of the tribe were related to each other, often through a common female ancestor, tribal decisions were usually made by consensus rather than by a formal vote. Each able-bodied person had a well-defined role to play within the tribe. They taught their children at an early age to assume the expected role within the group. Older males taught boys the skills they needed to survive as adults. They learned to run, swim, climb, hunt, and fight. Girls learned how to cook, plank, to skin was edible from poisonous herbs, dress animals, etc. Most of their tools were stone aids, such as stone tip weapons, knives, and hatches. They made crude holes from wood, and used bone hooks of fish. Sometimes they used fish nets and traps. Women weaved cloths from grass fibers which they sewed with needles made from animal bones. The tribe worked, played, and conducted most of its activities as a group. And their interaction with other societies were usually communal. Generally, the sexes separated at the age of puberty. Men and women did not congregate together publicly. All of the tribal leaders were male, but women readily accepted their subordinate role within the society. Elder women exercised great influence among younger women. Parents arranged marriages, and not unlike old world societies, exchanged diaries. Usually girls married not long after they reached puberty. While polygamy was fairly widespread, most men did not have more than two or three wives usually because of limited economic means. Some of the peoples of the lower Mississippi Valley were among the first of the North American Indians to plant corn on a significant basis. Despite the absence of draft animals, corn flourished from human cultivation because of the very rich delta soil which was continually rewarded not only by the Mississippi itself, but its various tributaries. This culture developed around 800 AD, following the cultivation of northern flint corn which could be grown in a short period of time, even in the Midwest, where the growing season was shorter. The close proximity to water allowed some to supplement their diet with fish, waterfowl, shrimp, crabs, and oysters. Women performed most of the domestic chores, while the men basically reserved their energy for the hunt and for war. Deer, bear, geese, ducks, and rabbits, and alligators existed in great abundance. These animals served not only as a source of food, but their forests and skins were used for clothing as well. The region of the lower Mississippi River Valley belonged to a loose federation of Choctaws who divided into a number of tribal villages, which included the Homa, the Bayagula, the Pascagoula, and the Changipaho and Ponchatoula. All of these groups belonged to either the Muscogean or Tunigan. Two of the three large language groupings identified by the early French settlers. One of the most advanced of the Indian groups in this area was the proud Natchez. The great son was their leader. He descended through a female line and was worshipped as a deity who, according to legend, had descended from the sun god who built the first great temple of perpetual fire. The temple stood on a mound eight feet high with a pitch roof. It contained the bones of deceased great sons. At all times, three logs burned on the fire, carefully attended by an appointed guardian. The little sons, close relatives of the great son, 
attended his personal needs. Common subjects never approached the great son without special marks of reverence. Although the Natchez were mild and peaceful, they were proud, brave, and determined. When they encountered Europeans who considered them haughty, conflict was almost inevitable, and the Natchez civilization was one of the first of the lower valley civilizations to be destroyed. It is no longer debatable about whether Columbus or some other modern European explorer arrived in the New World first. In fact, there is strong evidence that periodic migrations of other migrants from Old World societies worship on New World shores as late as 500 to 1000 AD, when the Polynesian Islands were first populated. While New World and Old World inhabitants enjoyed relatively peaceful relations when they first met, in the long run, contact between the two proved to be deadly for the Indians. At first, the French sought and received assistance from the natives. The French, probably more than any other European society, assimilated much of the Indian culture. They retained many Indian names for local places, such as Caddo, Washita, Tangipaho, Bagula, Huma, Chitamaka, Apalus is the name of a few. This stands in contrast to the English who attempted to replicate Old England in New England with such names as New London, New Bedford, New Hampshire, or New York. When the Spanish explorers made their first appearance here in mid-16th century, they had an immediate impact upon the Indians, which dramatically affected them for the future. First, the Spanish brought horses. Indians first Caddo in northwestern Louisiana, and later others, quickly adapted to horses, both as beasts of burdens as well as for transportation. The possession of horses as personal items also helped to weaken the strong communal bond which had long characterized Indian societies. Second, the Spanish transmitted old world diseases which proved to be devastating, in many cases fatal because Indians had no immunity to them. These included influenza, measles, cholera, dysentery, typhus, or smallpox, sometimes fatal to Europeans, but considerably more deadly to Indians. In the long run, disease, war, and other social pressures drove the Indians to practical extinction. When the French first arrived at the end of the 17th century, an estimated 70,000 Indians lived in the lower Mississippi Valley, considerably fewer than there had been two centuries earlier. But this figure would never be reached again. Today, only three, the Chitamaka, the Huma, the Tunica Biloxi, of the many Indian tribes which once called Louisiana home, remain. The Franks first developed an interest in Louisiana as an extension of their earlier settlements in New France, the heart of present-day Canada. In 1534, Jacques Cordier explored the St. Lawrence River Valley as far as present-day Montreal. While he failed in his primary mission, which was to find the fabled Northwest Passage to the Orient, his efforts set in motion future French explorations across the northeastern sector of North America. When in 1604, Samuel de Champlain organized the first permanent French settlement in North America at Acadia, he followed earlier patterns established by Cordier. Champlain exchanged young French cabin boys for young Indian boys, with the hope that each group would quickly learn the other's language and facilitate communications in the future. Within four years, he had pushed farther into the interior and established Quebec, which began to attract a motley crew of foreign traders, missionaries, adventurers, and soldiers. Before too long, the French had pushed as far west as the Great River, which the local Indians called the Mississippi. In 1672, Father Jacques Marquette and his companion, Louis Joliet, traced the river as far south as its confluence with the Arkansas River before returning home. Ten years later, a young nobleman, Robert de La Salle, sailed the entire length of the river and on April 9th, 1682. 
claim all the land drained by the Mississippi and its various tributaries for France. La Salle shrewdly named it La Louisiane in honor of his king, Louis XIV. La Salle set sail for France without returning to Quebec. He brought with him maps of La Louisiane, which he had purposely distorted to make it appear that Louisiana was closer to gold-rich Mexico. Louis was so impressed, he made La Salle governor of Louisiana and sent him back in 1684. La Salle expected to organize his new colony along similar lines to that of Quebec, but he ran into difficulties from the beginning. First, on the return voyage to La Louisiane, he had difficulty relocating the mouth of the river from the open sea. In fact, he missed the mouth of the Mississippi entirely and landed farther west on the east coast of Texas, somewhere near present-day Matagato Bay. The ship carrying most of the supplies sank, and as a result, a bad start within three years had turned into a complete disaster. By the end of the second year, LaSalle's little fourth in East Texas had so deteriorated that he decided he had to secure help from Quebec for his rapidly dwindling population. He never returned to Quebec, but in March of 1687, several of his own men assassinated him near the Brazos River. LaSalle's assassination sealed the fate of the survivors of Fort St. Louis. Those who survived an attack by Indians died at the hands of or were taken captives of the Spanish who came up from Mexico. The indiscriminate killing of men, women, and children of both the Indians and Spanish undoubtedly convinced the French authorities not to include women or children on the next colonizing attempt to Louisiana. Sadly, the first settlement in La Louisiane, actually outside of modern Louisiana, disappeared into history. It was nearly a dozen years later, after the end of the War of the League of Augsburg, a King William's War, before Louis XIV sent over another colonizing group to renew La Salle's dream. The new group was headed by two French-Canadian brothers, Pierre Le Marnet, Sieur Diverville, and his younger brother, Jean-Baptiste Le Marnet, Sieur de Bienville. Iverville had known La Salle fairly well, when the latter had talked with him on occasional visits to Iberville's father, one of the largest landowners in Quebec. When the Lomarnay brothers arrived to set up their first settlement at Fort Morapa, near present-day Biloxi, they planned a society similar to Quebec, where Indians would be at the core of their settlement. Iberville, although officially the highest-ranking officer, never spent more than six months at a time in the colony. Between his initial arrival in late January, 1699, and his final departure in May 172, he had made three round trips between Louisiana and France. The outbreak of the War of the Spanish Succession, or Queen Anne's War, prevented his return because as a captain in the Royal Navy, he returned to active duty. He died in 1706 without ever having returned to Louisiana. During his brief stay here, Iverville had outlined the beginning of his policy, which for the most part, an expansion of the Canadian model. It involved major dependence on the Indians, who along with his collection of coureurs de bois, soldiers, adventurers, bureaucrats, and priests, formed the nucleus of the colony. Iverville followed the example earlier used by Cartier and Champlain in opening contact with local Indians. He either went in person or sent out emissaries to assure the Indians of their peaceful intentions. He left young cabin boys to live among the Indians to learn their language and customs. The Lamones made a courtesy call on the great son of the Natchez with whom they smoked a calumet, a ceremony the great son shared only with dignitaries. They also called on the tribal chiefs of the Chickasaws. French men seemed to prefer Indian maidens to French women, who were always few in number. Besides, not only did Indian women make good consorts, they did most of the farming. And few of the original French settlers had farming backgrounds. Many of the Indian women had been enslaved from other tribes and were profitably sold to the French for guns, or knives, or liquor. <laughs> 
Within a few years, there was considerable intermingling of French and Indian blood. In 1706, however, Bienville reversed the assimilation policy because he believed that increased French residency among the interior Indians interfered with his plans to have them provide the colony with most of his food. Consequently, he forced many of the French husbands to leave both their wives and children, ironically depriving the French of a natural source for population increase. Iberville had purposely chosen to locate Fort Maurepas on the Gulf Coast instead of the Mississippi. Actually, they found the mouth of the Mississippi within weeks of their arrival and ascended it as far north as present-day Baton Rouge. Iberville believed that for strategic purposes, the Gulf Coast was the best site for the principal settlement. The Anvil, on the other hand, fell in love with a crescent-shaped bend in the river and proposed locating the major settlement there. He observed an almost complete water route between the river and Lake Pontchartrain, but Iberville decided against it and thus delayed the founding of New Orleans by nearly 20 years. Iberville and many ship captains like him throughout the first half of the 18th century believed that the treacherous currents of the river made it all but impossible to navigate large ships upriver. Even after the relocation of the capital to New Orleans, many ship captains would discharge their cargo at Gulf Coast ports rather than risk running onto the rocks near the mouth of the Mississippi River. While a Gulf Coast offered some strategic advantages over an inland site on the river itself, it did present several serious challenges. Most of the soil was either too swampy or too marshy or too sandy to support agriculture. This increased the demand on neighboring Indians to feed themselves as well as the increase in the French population. In addition to the original Fort Maurepas, the French within a few years added settlements at Mobile and later Fort Boulay, a small garrison barely within the Mississippi River Valley, following an incident with would-be British settlers which became known in colonial folklore as the Tour des Anglais, of the turnaround of the English. The tradition of French settlement was built within a square shaped walls with virtually no conveniences and few necessities. There were barracks for soldiers, a chapel, storehouse, commandant's quarters, and a guardhouse. Those who live outside the walls live with Indians or in isolated huts. Initially, the average settler wore clothes that were too warm for the humid Gulf climate, but often they had become worn or tattered and insufficient for the damp cold of the winter. The very survival of the first settlements depended upon the French ships, which not only brought in more settlers, but also familiar foods from France. For many Frenchmen, coarse Indian cornbread was a welcome relief against starvation, but they much preferred traditional wheat. Unfortunately, not only did wheat cost more, but the ships which brought it here came in frequently. During the early years, local authorities often sent newcomers to live among the Indians until they could find a place for them. Since many of the original settlers had no marketable skills, most remained with the Indians for a good while. Occasionally, when ships delayed even longer than usual, whole garrisons of soldiers escaped to live for months at a time with the Indians. After nearly 10 years, Bienville had done very little to gallicize the culture. To be sure, the various outlying posts bore French names, and each flew French fleur de lis but very little change had been made to the physical features of Louisiana. The average settler lived at or below the subsistence level, slightly no better than their Indian neighbors or hosts. Many grumbled about the relative prosperity enjoyed by Bienville and his close friends and relatives, and eventually an official complaint reached the king, alleging corruption and favoritism on the part of Bienville. At first the king, who suspected that Bienville's misconduct probably explained Louisiana's lack of success, appointed a new governor, but he died before his arrival. A royal investigator arrived and after three years returned with a report which neither condemned but did not exonerate entirely Bienville. Instead, the king decided to retain Bienville, but as a subordinate to new governor, the founder of Detroit, Antoine Delamotte Cadillac who arrived in May 1713. 
Cadillac survival coincided with the beginning of the first proprietary period. Louis XIV decided to turn Louisiana into a proprietary, similar to the successful British experiments in Maryland and Pennsylvania. He convinced Antoine Crozat, Marquis de Châtel, that Louisiana would be a good investment. Upon Cadillac's arrival at Dolphin Island, he found a primitive settlement inhabited by disconsolate and mostly poverty-stricken people. In an early report to Crozat, he described the desperate plight of the colonists and the desolate condition of the land, but he added a postscript, he would soon make things right. Cadillac pursued a get-tough policy taught both French and Indians, and soon he was quarreling with everyone, including Bienville, who was none too happy about his emotion. Cadillac's earlier reputation for dislike and abusive treatment of Indians proved true. He refused the calumet of the great son, who naturally felt insulted. After the Natchez, probably at the instigation of the British, attacked and killed several French settlers at Mobile, Cadillac threatened wholesale retaliation. But Bienville persuaded him to try a more moderate approach. Bienville not only forced the arrest and return of the guilty parties, but he also held in custody the tribal leaders until a ransom of 2,500 logs were delivered. These he used to build Fort Rosalie on land from which the Natchez were forcibly evicted. The proud Natchez did not forget these indignities and later got revenge. After three years, the proprietor's enthusiasm for Kadiak waned, and Crozac replaced Kadiak with Bienville, but only on an interim basis. A new governor, Jean-Michel Lopinet, arrived in March of 1717. But within months, Crozat had surrendered the colony back into the crown's hand, or more accurately, Philip, Duke of Orleans, regent for five-year-old Louis XV. Crozat not only made no profit, but his continued involvement in Louisiana threatened him with great personal loss. The colony had not grown very much. The estimated population now reached 550, even though two new settlements had been added one at Natchez, Fort Rosalie in 1716, and another one at Nacatosh, Fort Jean-Baptiste in 1714, the first permanent French settlement within the state of Louisiana. Still, Louisiana did not look much different from what it had been prior to the arrival of the French. Natives and newcomers continued to exist in a sort of symbiotic relationship. The Indians, for the most part, the hosts but things would soon change as Louisiana passed into the hands of a huge trading company hated by the celebrated Scotsman, John Law. John Law, a Parisian bon vivant, persuaded the region to charter a state bank and to issue paper currency against its holding. The novelty of the proposal and the practically empty treasury that Louis XIV had left after his 72-year reign influenced Philip's affirmative answer. The bank got off to a great start. Soon it had attracted so much capital that it had surplus funds to organize a trading company, which within two years had merged with most other trading companies to form a huge conglomerate called variously the Mississippi, Louisiana, a company of the West. Because Crozat had backed out his agreement that after only five years, the region imposed specific conditions on law. His charter obligated him to transport at least 6,000 Catholic European settlers to Louisiana and at least 3,000 African slaves within 10 years. The terms were concluded in September 1717. Louisiana would never be quite the same again. In an attempt to attract new self-supporting colonists to Louisiana, law offered two types of inducements to small, independent farmers and middle-class commoners, he offered land grants called habitations, about 500 acres of land, plus a few tools and small farm animals. To the very wealthy and nobility, he offered concessions, huge land grants, amounting to tens and occasionally hundreds of thousands of acres of land. The recipients of these grants had to transport their own servants and or slaves. The holders of the concessions also received the right to govern their land. At first law printed up an attractive little pamphlet 
which extolled the virtues of life in Louisiana. It completely distorted living conditions and only proved moderately successful in attracting new migrants. Ironically, many of them Swiss and Germans from the Low Countries. Law next received royal permission to recruit inmates from the various Parisian institutions, orphanages, asylums, and jailhouses. Eventually, petty criminals such as pickpockets, thieves, prostitutes, and vagabonds were given a choice, a life of freedom in Louisiana or imprisonment in France. Surprisingly, a large number accepted the latter, which forced company agents to scowl the countryside for recruits, voluntary and involuntary. Some agents returned with unruly children and unwanted spouses. No questions were asked, and agents received their commissions. Law obtained about 4,000 of those forced migrants, or engagés, who would serve for three years and then be eligible for part of the land. Joining the engagés and French and Swiss soldiers, who the company treated almost like servants or the slaves who soon found their way into Louisiana. Many of the engagés died before they reached Louisiana and a good number more died shortly after their arrival. Because many of them were the equivalent of modern street people, they arrived in weakened condition after a long and arduous voyage from France. One source estimates that of 900 convicts and engagés who arrived alive, only 60 survived the first year. Law chose Arkansas as his personal concession, and he first attempted to settle it with German migrants but after a brief but bitter stay there, they threatened to return home. So Bienville, who had been reappointed governor, decided to settle them upriver from the new capital that he finally got permission to build. The Germans received permission to settle about 20 miles upriver on a grant name like Côte des Allemands, German coast. Here they began to form, eventually began to supply much of the colonists' food supply. The strange tongues of these migrants at first separated from their French-speaking neighbors did not last very long. They quickly became assimilated to the French society through intermarriage and by gallicizing their names and customs. Within a generation or two, only a very little German was spoken, and much of that mixed with French words. In October 1717, Bienville received word of his appointment as governor, and for the first time he received the title governor. He also received permission and instruction to relocate the capital to the bank of the Mississippi River, exactly where he had originally proposed in 1699. Law had company officials draw up the design of the new town and named it La Nouvelle Orléans in honor of the regent. The first map of New Orleans, dated 1718, included street names for some of the most important figures in France who support law deemed crucial. For example, the widest street in the center of the town bore the name of the regent, Orléans or Orleans. Streets were named for Louis XIV's bats and sons, the Duc du Maine and the Count Toulouse. Three saints were honored, Saints Louis, Peter, and Philip. The Orleans evolved slowly. Hurricanes in 1719 and again in 1721 destroyed much of the work that had been done since 1718 when Bienville first arrived here. In 1720, a new and determined builder arrived with Law's Plains and over the next four years, he laid out the nucleus of Newtown. Adrian Pogé laid out the city in typical French-Canadian style. New Orleans was wholly enclosed within walls, surrounded by forts, one at each end of the rectangle. He laid out public square, the Place d'Homme, across from the church, appropriately named St. Louis in honor of Francis Patriot Saint. Other public buildings and squares include the soldiers' barracks, the government house, storehouse, and the arsenal, located upriver outside of the walls, and a cemetery. By 1722, when the population of New Orleans reached 400, Bienville designated New Orleans as a new capital. For the next decade, New Orleans attracted a heterogeneous collection of Indians, French, and Africans of all sorts. For the next century and a quarter century, New Orleans served as Louisiana's political, social, and economic capital. 
Prior to 1719, there was an occasional African slave found in Louisiana, brought in by individual owners. However, a key to Law's plan for economic stability was a plantation economy based largely on African slave labor. Law received permission to trade slaves directly from Africa to Louisiana. He instructed his agents to seek out slaves who had prior experience in agriculture, especially rice, for the marsh lands of Louisiana. The decision to bring slaves directly from Africa had a major impact on the development of African slavery in Louisiana. Unlike among both the Spanish and British, who relied heavily on different types of slave traders who brought in a mix of slaves from many different parts of Africa, most of the slaves who came to Louisiana came directly from Senegambia. Geographically, the Senegambia region includes the area between the Senegal and Gambia rivers. The Wolof were located at the northwest corner of the Senegal River, which runs from the Atlantic Ocean southeastward. East of the Wolofs were the Fulbe. The Bambara people were sandwiched between the southern end of the Senegal River and the Niger River, which flows almost due south. The Gambia River formed the southern boundary of the Senegambia. The Mandinga were found in the southwest corner as the Gambia flows from the Atlantic Ocean into the interior. The largest number of slaves sent to Louisiana in the 20s were the Bambara, who the French described as, quote, robust, good natured, and intelligent, end quote. The French considered them good slaves because, quote, the labor attached to servitude does not bother them at all. They love their masters, are obedient, and are never subject to flight, revolt or despair. The Bambara later disproved this description when they played a prominent role in the Natchez War in 1729. Many of the Bambara were sold by their Muslim neighbors to Mandingo. Lesser numbers of Fulbo, Wolof, and Mandingo also came. 17th and 18th century travelers described the Sinian Gambia as a region of homogeneous cultures. Most of the various people of the area lived as peaceful neighbors for many centuries. At various times, they belonged to medieval empires of the Ghana, Amoravid, Mali, and Songhoi. As such, they enjoyed trade with diverse places such as Spain, Morocco, Florence, Venice, and Timbuktu. One of the centers of trade and learning in the medieval world, far surpassing that of Rome or any other European city. Most societies were composed of groups of family clans who shared a common patrilineal ancestry. Most marriages were endogamous and arranged by the fathers of the bride and the groom. Usually girls married at or right at the age of puberty. The bride's family provided a dowry, which often consisted of practical gifts that people could use during their marriage. Since polygamy was widespread and most men had several wives, the typical African family consisted of a husband, father, and his several wives and their children. As could be expected, children usually bonded with their mothers more readily than with their fathers. Children, including half-siblings, generally bonded together on the basis of their shared paternity. In many African societies, first cousins were often considered brothers. These extended kinships, unlike the traditional European nuclear family, would be more readily adaptable to New World slavery. It also helped to preserve a tradition of communal activities. By the late medieval period, most imperial officers embraced Islam, while there was a sprinkling of Christian and Jews found in the trading centers. In the interior, however, none of the two major religious camps had made much headway in converting the masses of inhabitants who lived in the small villages of Sinan Gambia. Most retained polytheistic beliefs in gods related to nature. Many also believed in what W.E.B. Du Bois called Obi, the belief in spirits. There was a cleansing ceremony similar to Christian baptism, but its basic function seemed to be used to rid one of evil spirits. Like all of the world's people, dancing played a significant role in their daily lives. Most of the dancing was typically a group dancing and singing. Not only did they sing and perform dances in honor of their various gods, but singing was very frequent when they performed their domestic chores. This practice continued throughout slavery and beyond. The work songs always served as an important part of the work routine. Many uninformed observers who watched slaves singing assumed that they were expressing their happiness amid slavery. In fact, Group singing was one of the ways that they found escape from it. In New Orleans, 
Group singing and dancing became a regular feature of the slave market, which lasted for more than a century. Congo Square, so named because of the large assemblage of slaves who congregated there every weekend to sell their wares, was perhaps more noted for slave dancing, which took place while slaves waited for customers. The focus of slave interest was not the dance, but the market. Dancing was always secondary. Selling was their primary objective. Europeans did not begin African slavery. Its origin antedated written records. Africans, like other civilizations, practiced extensive slavery. For a long time, they had exchanged slaves with various parts of the world. In the Senegambia region, however, most of the slaves were indigenous people. Most of the slaves were captives. A few had been condemned to slavery for punishment. However, there was always a certain kind of fluidity about African slavery, which did not exist among European slavery. African slavery did not create a permanent underclass. Individual groups that rule today could become enslaved on tomorrow. Additionally, there were none of the racial stigmas which would characterize New World slavery. When the French came to this area for slaves, it was not by accident. A well-organized slave trade between European traders and African rulers to supply the New World with slaves had been in existence for nearly two centuries. The first French traders arrived off the coast in 1718. After securing permission from the local rulers, they began to contract for slaves from the interior. In 1718, the first ship load arrived off the coast of Biloxi. Law had already established the price that planters had to pay. Initially, he provided tobacco planters with slaves under less than generous terms. Consequently, there were practically no sales that first year, which forced the company to moderate its prices. After 1720, the company made slaves available for one half of the purchase price. The remaining to be repaid within three years after the first tobacco crops was harvested. Additionally, the company agreed to purchase all the tobacco at very generous prices, in some cases, well beyond its actual market value. Governor Bienville received instructions to send most of the slaves to the interior plantations north of Natchez. But this would disturb the policy presently pursued by Bienville, which utilized Indians in these same areas to provide much of the colonists' food supply. Therefore, when the first shipped load of slaves arrived, Bienville kept most of them south of Natchez and distributed some among his friends, the remainder among Indians to grow corn, not tobacco. As late as 1722, Bienville had yet to deliver a single slave to the Uplung district. As a result, the initial acculturation of the majority of Africans of the New World was facilitated by their early interaction with the oldest New World residents, not their erstwhile masters of French. Many Africans learned Indian languages before they learned French. Although technically slaves, the Africans did not find Indian slavery arduous or unbearable. Many African men took Indian wives, many who were also slaves. To Africans, this new land, in some respect, resembled parts of their ancestral land. The Indians, who never adopted the European method of intensive agriculture, did not force their slaves to work beyond physical endurance. In fact, the evidence suggests that slaves pretty much determined their own level of work. Slavery here closely resembled slavery in many parts of Africa where the slave never sank to the level of a chattel, but occupied an inferior social status in the society. Enslavement in Africa most often resulted from war, where victim lives were spared, but in return, they became slaves. However, since today's masters could easily become tomorrow's slaves, slavery among Africans was always much more fluid rather than static, as among the much more class-conscious Europeans. It is ironic then that the slaves slipped here to work for French planters on tobacco plantations received introduction to the New World by way of Indian farms. They planted corn, not tobacco, and interacted with their Indian masters on a basis that would have been unheard of among the French planters who observe a rigid code of conduct between social classes. Bienville's steadfast refusal to adhere to company policy erupted into a bitter political dispute after the arrival in 1723 of Jacques Delachaise, the new company agent, 
who insisted that Bienville follow official company policy. Bienville's continual resistance resulted in his recall in 1725 and replacement with a new governor, Etienne Boucher de la Perrier. Perrier and Delessez quickly reversed Bienville's policy and recalled African slaves who had been distributed among the Indians and subsequently redistributed them among the new planters farther into the interior. This caused a change in the government's Indian policy as well. Not only did the policy change deprive the Indians of their slave laborers, but also since they occupied some of the best land, the government began to pressure them to leave. The recall of Africans from among Indians also disturbed the relationship between African and Indians. Not only did Indians work their slaves less rigorously than Europeans, but marriage between Indians and Africans had helped Africans accommodate to their new situation. Since most of the slaves had always been free in their homelands, their recent enslavement was a cultural shock, but at least the lifestyle that they live among the Indians was not too dissimilar from that of Africa. Now, however, after they went among the French, they found a much more demand in servitude. French planters, anxious to put in a crop, showed no concern about the personal comfort of their slaves. To many, they valued the slaves no more than they valued their animals. Despite Bienville's promulgation of the Court Noir in 1724, which recognized certain basic rights for the slaves, it remained largely ignored. After Bienville's departure, Perrier and Delachaise distributed even more slaves as more than 3,000 came in between 1725 and 1730. As more slaves arrived, this correspondingly created more demand for more land to grow more tobacco. But this required squeezing out Indians from most of their own land. Perrier and Delachaise did not consider Indians in the same light as Bienville, who had carefully pursued the live and let live policy. The new Indian policy now reflected the new reality. Indians no longer determined the survival of the colonists. Some might even consider the native populace a nuisance, particularly those who remained on valuable farmland. This change of policy erupted into armed conflict as a result of an attempt by Commandant Pierre Echeport of the Natchez district to evict the Natchez from their ancestral lands following the harvest of their crops in the fall of 1729. Without warning, the Natchez launched a surprise attack against Fort Rosalie and killed all but a few survivors. The Natchez enlisted the support of some African slaves who also resented the harsh treatment they received at the hands of the French. Soon the conflict widened and threatened the security of New Orleans itself. Governor Perrier led a counterattack but met defeat in January 1730. Perrier ultimately prevailed by adopting a strategy of dividing blacks and reds. The final defeat of the Natchez proved disastrous for that proud society. Those who survived received severe punishment, burning at the stake, or some other form of execution. But the French sent most of the survivors into slavery into the West Indies. A few hundred escaped and found refuge among neighboring Chickasaws, but the war brought an end to the organized Natchez society. The war also brought an end to the company's activities in Louisiana. The fighting so disrupted normal activities that practically all tobacco cultivation ceased for at least two years. The company's fortunes, so intricately tied to Louisiana, now sank to an all-time low, and it simply returned control of the colony into the king's hand. The end of company rule had a great impact on Franks, African, and Indians. For the planters who had received such generous price support for their tobacco, it was no longer feasible for most of them to compete on open markets. Most planters now had more slaves than they needed, but they still had to provide them with at least minimal subsistence. In other words, they had to provide them with the same level of support at the same time that their profits declined or vanished entirely. Fighting had also forced the German farmers to abandon their farms upriver from New Orleans. Several years after the war, they still remained in New Orleans because they feared to return home. But their continuous residence in New Orleans created two problems. They no longer supplied the area with food, and they aggregated the problem by their consumption of the reduced amounts of food now available. When Bienville returned, 
He forced them to return home, but he also promised to protect them. For many of the artisans and unskilled workers who had found employment working for the company of wealthier settlers, they had to find alternative sources of employment. However, that proved to be difficult with so many competing for so few jobs. As a result, some of them drifted into the interior to live with a trade with the Indians. When Bienville returned as new governor in 1733, he instituted a modified version of his earlier Indian policy. He carefully repaired relations among those Indians who had remained friendly to the French, but he also demanded that the Chickasaws turn over to him all of the Natchez refugees. When the Chickasaws refused, he made war against them for the next seven years, when he finally forced them to sign a new treaty with the French. However, for the remainder of his tenure, and most of the French colonial rule, Indians faced no new pressure to give up their lands to the French. The Natchez War. This war proved to be a watershed in Louisiana history. It served as a major catalyst in creating what later became known as a Creole culture. The war and its aftermath served to bring French, African, and Indians together in a manner never foreseen. Both European and African colonists interacted with one another and with the natives create a common culture. The common language, while officially French, became more and more Creole French, with heavy borrowing from both African and Indians. Much of the food that all three races consumed reflected the contributions that each made to the new cuisine. For example, a basic African stew, gumbo, developed into a Creole dish, which included Indian spices, such as filet, as well as French sauces, fish, rice, beef and pork dishes reflected a blending of old world and new world cuisine. While the French often dressed in traditional European clothing, they adapted some form of Indian apparel, especially those made from animal skins of forest. The African dress generally reflected both cultures as well as their own. The close interaction between Indians and Africans remained strong for the future through intermarriage and trade. Africans and Indians continued to provide New Orleans and local markets with fresh vegetable, seafood, and game. During the market law, African vendors often amused themselves with singing and dancing, so much so that the casual observer assumed that the group gathered primarily to socialize rather than trade. Many Africans adapted the Indian use of feathers and animal skins as a part of their dress, especially for festivals and ceremonies. Even today, many African, quote, Indians reflect this tradition and the elaborate Mardi Gras Indian costumes they wear. Although many of them have little or no Indian ancestry, they continue to preserve that culture, which over the years became much more African than Indian. The Natchez War had a very unexpected but salutary effect on African slaves. Ironically, at the end of the war, the French began a conscious attempt to assimilate Africans into their segment of the society. Lepage Duprat, one of the company directors, actively supported this new policy. He encouraged the cultural assimilation of Africans into the French society. He believed that only by making the slave feel a part of the society would the French lessen the possibility of another revolt involving perhaps an even larger number of blacks. By the time that Bienville returned, blacks now made up more than half of the colonist population. Bienville and Duprats began to enforce those provisions of the Court Noir which recognized the personal rights of the slave, including the right to be baptized, legally married, and to receive the sacraments of the Catholic Church. The Court also protected slave families as it forbade separation of slave spouses, but required the sale of family lots, that is, the parents and children must be sold together. Many planters brought their slaves to be baptized, and some stood as godparents for them. Slavery also moderated for the better, and many instances much more resembled domestic servitude than tattered slavery. These changes resulted from a commonality of interest between masters, slaves, the government, and the church. Many masters discovered that it served theirs as well as the slaves' interests if they allowed their slaves to manage their offices. 
It relieved masters of their obligation to feed them, thus lowering their operational costs. But it also provided the slaves with an opportunity to earn small sums of money by raising garden vegetables, fishing, hunting, gathering firewood, etc. They could sell these items to earn money to purchase personal items and supplement their own food supply. But it also served as an important safety valve. It would lessen the possibility of rebellion caused by the denial of personal freedom. The ability to travel freely after work and on weekends increased contact among slaves, which allowed them a chance to meet in fellowship. And since so many of them had come from the same parts of Africa, they obviously had a strong sense of commonality. This change in slave policy with increased mobility for slaves once again widened contact among Africans and Indians. The close contact between Indians and Africans helped to stabilize, and so the government at least tacitly condoned it. The church used this contact as an opportunity for conversion among both Indians and Africans, especially as the latter often led the former into the church. While African slaves and Indians never achieved equality with whites, there was almost continual interaction among them. One found them attending the same church, at taverns, in the markets. Blacks, reds, and whites worked in the same fields, hunting and fished together. Sometimes black and Indian slaves ran away together, on occasion accompanied by white soldiers or servants. While the government always prohibited intermarriage between Africans and whites, unofficial cohabitation occurred occasionally between them, very frequently between blacks and Indians. This intermingling among French, Africans, and Indians soon produced a new culture with major contributions from each group. During its first quarter century, most of French Louisiana remained largely as it had been prior to the arrival of any Old World settlers. However, by the mid-century, African and French imprints became increasingly pronounced. By the midpoint of the 18th century, one could accurately speak of Louisiana society in many ways separate and distinct from, yet reflective of its African, French, and Indian origins. Its culture had become a Creole amalgam, which remained distinct in the large American culture long after it had become a part of the United States. Louisiana never became the prosperous colony as early as French organizers had envisioned it. For a little more than three decades after the Natchez War, the colony remained France's poorest colony. For a brief period in the 1740s, there was an economic upswing as many planters turned to the cultivation of indigo. However, this was short-lived, and most colonists faced insolvency. The slave ships had stopped coming, and the ships bringing in new immigrants were few and far between. Following this disastrous defeat to the English in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, France decided to cut its ties with Louisiana and turned it over to its ally, Spain, which had also lost heavily to the hated British. On March 5, 1766, Don Antonio de Ulloa officially accepted control of Louisiana for his most Catholic majesty, Charles III of Spain. For the rest of the century, Louisianians, black and white, free and unfree, would live under Spanish control. <laughs>